a flexitarian is a person, well, one lady I saw online was describing herself. She said, I'm usually a vegetarian, but I like bacon. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that's intriguing. So I thought I'd go online and look up a bunch of stuff about flexitarians. And flexitarians are, you know, they're, they're into being healthy and eating healthy and mostly vegetables, but every once in a while, they like a good little hamburger or some bacon. So we all kind of snicker and laugh. Well, that's kind of silly because a vegetarian, by definition, doesn't like meat or doesn't eat meat. They have a, a problem with meat. But these people, they don't really have a problem with meat. They just understand that vegetables may be better for you than too much meat, and so they just are flexitarians. And so they're not 100% committed to being a vegetarian. That's the way most Christians are. They are not committed to being a Christian all the time. See, if, it, if, it, if doing God's will, like Jesus said, your will be done, not mine, becomes inconvenient, then they don't do it. Or if it becomes uncomfortable, then we don't do it. So I guess that's called flexa-Christians. <laughs> I'm flexible as a Christian. I give when I want to give, but when it's asking too much, I don't. I, I will follow the Lord for the most part, but you know what? When it really comes down to it, just does Jesus have a right to interfere with my life? See, you have to determine when it comes to your Gethsemane, whose life are you living anyway? Whose life is this? Is it he who lives in us? And does he have the right to interfere? You know, I get phone calls and, and people say, uh, can you talk, you know? And, and I immediately think, I'm watching a hockey game. What do you mean, can I talk? <laughs> of course I can. I can put that thing on hold and talk. But there are times when someone calls and, and our, our, our satellite dish, you know, it um, tells you who's on the phone because it's hooked up. So up on the screen comes, you know, Rich, Richard Stone, you know, or up on the screen comes unknown number. Well, you know how many unknown numbers I answer? None. I don't ever answer. And I don't answer 800 numbers and 877 numbers, 866 numbers. I don't answer any of those calls, you know. And, and so in a sense, I say, no, that's an inconvenience. I don't want it. Now, I wonder if you're watching something and up on the screen, the Lord says, we need to talk. And you say, I don't know, kind of inconvenient right now. Or if the Lord comes to us and says to us, would you please stop what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're saying? Would you stop that habit? Would you just do, Lord, that's just a little too inconvenient right now. Do you think you could come back a different time? You know what? I think God enjoys being inconvenient. I really do. I think he just enjoys saying, I'm going to mess with your life. I'm going to mess with you right now. I think he likes that. I think he does that. I think he stirs in our life. You know how some people are stirrers? They stir up emotions. They stir up trouble. I think God stirs up trouble in our lives. He just stirs it up and then says, now let's see how you do. And our reaction to the stirring tells more about us than we probably care to, re to believe. Really, we've been studying the book of James in our small groups. And the first chapter of James really is about God stirring our hearts, stirring our lives, bringing us into problems so that we can be tested, not tempted. Tempted means to sin. God doesn't tempt us. But he does test us. And testing tells us how refined we are, how pure we are, how good we are, how well we're doing. That's what God does, and he stirs things. And I think God just simply says, I know how you feel, but it's Sunday morning. Come on and worship. You know, that's kind of inconvenient. And Lord, I'm a little tired. It's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable sometimes to follow God, to obey Him. And I thought, is, is that really what it means to be a Christian? To be at times challenged in my in, 
convenience and being uncomfortable. Yeah, I think it really is. And I think the trouble in the church today is we want it to be convenient. Now, some of the things we make a convenience are how it makes us feel. A lady came to me one time and she said, would you just preach sermons that make us feel better? She did. I'll tell you what I told her. I said, if you'd do what I'd preach, you'd feel better. <laughs> See, she just wanted to come to church to feel better. Coming to church is about worshiping God, hearing from Him. It sometimes is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable sometimes to read your Bible. That's why you don't. Because it's uncomfortable. Can you make yourself do something that's uncomfortable? Most of us say no. Well, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I'm about being comfortable. I'm about it being okay. I'm about being happy. I'm about being satisfied, fulfilled, self-actualized. Really. Jesus was about the Father's will, not about being self-actualized and self-assured, and not about how he felt about himself. He was about obeying God, the <coughs> Father. That's what he cared about, what the Father wanted. It was inconvenient. It was uncomfortable. And yet he said, not my will, but your will be done. And I've done a lot about this week and thinking, and I really struggled most of the week saying, Lord, um, what is it really like to be that committed so that it doesn't matter if it's uncomfortable, so that it doesn't matter if it's inconvenient? I want to learn. It takes time, energy, commitment. You want to learn, you have to read, you have to pray, you have to study when you don't feel like it. See, Jesus basically said, what I feel is, this isn't too exciting. But what I will do, choose, is to obey. What I'll do is what you want. It's kind of like when you're little kids, uh, you know, when they disobey and you, or they do something wrong to another kid and you say, tell him you're sorry, you know, say you're sorry, right? And the kid goes, sorry. And then you say, most parents will say, say it like you mean it. Well, the kid can't say it like you mean it because he doesn't mean it. Just say it. And with a little child, you say, say you're sorry. And they say, sorry. And then you say, now listen, this is about being sorry, not just saying it. But with a little kid, you start with, just say it. Don't let them get by with not saying it. Because at some point, hopefully, they get to where they mean it. Right? But just say it. And there are times in your walk when you have to do what God says because He says it, not because you feel like it. We of all people, Christians, do not run by how we feel. We run by what truth is and what God says. We do what God tells us. You know, I thought about Jesus and does he have the right to interfere in my life? I mean, really. When I told you whenever it comes up on the screen who's calling, you know, the first thing you think of was, oh, yeah, I want to talk to them. What does that mean? Well, they have the right to interfere, right? If you call and your name comes up, you have the right to interfere. So I answer the phone. 800 number comes up, they don't have the right to interfere with my life, right? It's like salesmen come, you know, call you, you know, no. No, I'm sorry. They'll say, hey, I don't know the number for some reason. It's a local number. I've gotten a lot of local numbers calling and saying, hey, I just want you to know that we're in the area. And I'm thinking, a salesman. It's a convenience call. Uh, it's a convenience call. No, this is a very inconvenient call. <laughs> and generally, I'll say, uh, no, I'm really not interested. Yeah, but we have it. No, no, thank you. And I'm very kind and very nice. And I just say, no, thank you. Have a good day. And I hang up. I, I can hear them. <laughs> You know, I can hear them on the phone. And I'm thinking, no, you are an inconvenience and you are not going to rule my life right now. You're not going to control what I do and say, you're done. I'm done with you. Right? But you call and I say, hey, how's it going? What are you doing? I'm kind of to the point. Matter of fact, not a lot of go talking going on. Right? Just what do you want? You wouldn't have called if you didn't want something. What do you want? You know? 
So I'm generally pretty, you know, pretty matter of fact, you know, which is, you know, fine. But when you call, it's not an inconvenience. When God comes into our hearts and says some things to us and tells us to do something, that's the response we need to have. Oh, it's the Lord. Not inconvenient. Shut everything else down. It's time to talk. It's time for God to speak. It's time to obey. It's time for Him to rule. It's not an inconvenience for the Lord to rule. He has a right to rule. And I thought about that right to rule. What is His right to interfere? Yours is, for my life, is that we are friends we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and you have a right to interfere. But what right does Jesus have to interfere in our lives? Well, he suffered for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus suffered the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, that he could reconcile us to God. Does he have a right to interfere? Oh, you bet. So what has Christ done for you that he ought to be able to interfere? Well, he shed his blood for you, suffered and died for you, suffered in Gethsemane horribly. You know, the Bible says he sweat like drops of blood. There wasn't blood coming out. It was like huge, thick sweating, so much suffering. I don't think I've ever sweat anything close to that. He paid a price. For the right to interfere. He did for us what no one else could do, and he has the right to interfere. So when he interferes and says, God, or he says to me, Roger, you need to change this, then the first thing I do is I perk up my ears and I say, you have a right to speak to me. I think there are a lot of people, Christians, who really believe Jesus has no right to interfere. No right to interfere. And I thought about his right as he suffered also the claim he has made on us. He owns us. We have been purchased with a price, his blood. You and I are purchased by him, and therefore he can interfere. Your boss at work says, you will work these, these hours, right? And if you go in at 8 and come home at 5 or whatever you work, or if you work from 7 till 7 or whatever hours you're supposed to work, you're there at work, and if the boss says this is what you're supposed to do, he has the right to tell you what to do. Why? Because he's paying you. And if you don't want to do what he says, or she says, that's just fine. But you don't get paid. And so if you say, I don't do that, I won't do that, and then he'll just say, that'll be fine, and you can go home. And don't come back, and you won't get paid. He has a right to interfere because of the price he's paying. And if you don't like the interference, you can give up the price and not get paid. And most of us would love to just say, I quit. I don't like this. But we can't because we got a house. Yeah, yeah, some, and Ed does. Ed just leaves and walks out, gets a new job. You know, uh, but you know what? It's, har it's harsh over there. You know. But you know, when we when we say, when we say to God, "You have no right to interfere," we think our lives are our own, and they are not. They have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. He owns me. He has the right to interfere. He suffered for me. He owns me. He claims my life. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And then he commands it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. When it comes to his interference in my life. By the way, interference is never convenient. And it's never, usually not comfortable. Look at chapter 9 and verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. See, it's a command that God interfere. Take up your cross daily. He must deny himself. Now, self-denial self is not the same as denying self. 
self-denial is I'm going to go out something. It's kind of like, you know, I really kind of look at Lent as kind of a silly thing. Lent is a season when people deny something. You know, I'm not going to eat hamburgers for the next two months. You know, I'm not going to do this for the next two months, which is a nice thing. But you are supposed to be denying self daily. Not for a period of time where you go through some silly little thing called, I won't do this because it's Lent. You need to be giving up self daily and say, it's not me, it's you, Lord. It's not what I want, it's what you want, God. It's not what I have intended, it's what you have intended, Lord. Denying self happens every day. Paul said it, I die daily. And that's what he was talking about here. That it is about what God has said. It's about God interfering in our plans. It's about God interfering in our future. It's about God interfering with our emotions. It's about God interfering with our activities. It's about God interfering with our habits. It's about God interfering with our desires. It's about God interfering every day. If Jesus could go to Gethsemane, and sweat like drops of blood and suffer can we not can we not give up things in our lives can we not let him interfere with us turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and I want you to see a little process for letting God interfere Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. It says, let us... Well, let's, verse, let's read verse 12, cha uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him. Fix your gaze on Jesus. I guess the question for this idea of interference is, what are you looking at? What are you looking at today? Jesus looked at the joy set before him. What's set before you? It is what is set before you that determines what you do. What are you looking at? You see, you look ahead and you say, well, I'm looking at a new house. I'm looking at new stuff. I'm looking at a better job. I'm looking at money. I'm looking at health. I'm, what in the world are you staring at? Because what you fix your attention on will determine what you do. What you fix your goals of your heart on will determine whether Jesus can interfere or not. There's a story about a young border guard, U.S. Mexican border, Pedro Gonzalez, a young Mexican boy, was coming across the border riding his bike with two bags of sand on his shoulders. The U.S. the guard knew he was knew that he was taking um, that he was smuggling something and so asked him to come over and stand and they stood and took the sandbags and told, asked him what they were and he said they were sand. So he cut open the sag bags, the sand poured them all out, it's just all sand. So he put it all back in the bag, tied it back up, put it on his shoulders and rode off his bike. Next day, came back, two more bags of sand. Border guard said, I know you're smuggling something. Checked them all over, got the bags of sand, cut them open, full of just sand. And the border guard was certain that this Mexican kid was smuggling. Had to be. And for weeks and weeks, it was sandbag after sandbag after sandbag. 
And finally, one day came, and he wasn't there any longer. Pedro was not coming across the border any longer. He wasn't there. Well, the guard happened to be in town, walking in the street, and he saw Pedro. He said, man, I haven't seen you in a while. He said, no, I'm not doing that anymore. He said, I know you were smuggling stuff. Tell me, what were you smuggling? And Pedro just got a big smile on his face, and he said, bicycles. <laughs> you see, your eyes were fixed on the sandbags. And he said, I was taking a new bicycle across every day. Never looked at the bike. See, what you fix your attention on controls everything. And if you don't fix your attention on Jesus, you won't like him interfering. And it'll always be an inconvenience. And following him will always be a problem. And obeying him will always be a struggle. You ought to get to your place in your Gethsemane when you say, not my will, but yours be done. When you struggle and say, oh God, I'm tired of it my way. Oh God, I'm sorry. I didn't realize this was about you. I had my eyes staring at the wrong things. Do not get to heaven and say, oh God, I wasn't watching you, was I? I have nothing to give you. When you come to the end and your, your lives are tested by God and he says, Wow, not much here. And you'll say, but I had this, and I had this, and I had this, and I had this. And the Lord will say, it's nothing. It's nothing. And you'll have nothing to lay at his feet. No crowns to lay at his feet. No great joy of saying, oh God, thank you. Thank you that when I w fixed my eyes on you and stared and gazed at you, that when you said, do this, I said, yes. When you said, stop that, I said, okay. When you said, quit that, I quit it. When you said, move here, I moved there. When you said, say this, I said this. Oh, God, thank you. Because now I have something in my hands to give you back to say thank you. Some of you are going to get before Jesus at the judgment seat where you'll stand and give an account for your life and you'll have nothing to give him because your eyes were fixed on the wrong things and you'll have nothing don't go there fix your eyes on Jesus fix your gaze on him fix your attention on him and you'll have something to give him when you get there there will be some who will get to heaven, and the Bible says, as by fire, the smell of hell on them with nothing to give. Nobody led to Christ. Nobody encouraged. Nobody blessed. And nothing to give Jesus. I look forward to getting to heaven and seeing people who I led to him. Who have you led? What are your eyes fixed on today? What are you here for? What does Easter mean anyway? Is it just a nice thing to say Jesus died for us? No, Jesus died so that you could live for him. Let God interfere with your life. You will be better. If you choose to not let him interfere, you will suffer. And some already are. There is suffering 
that goes on for eternity for those who won't let Christ interfere. And there is such joy when we do let him interfere. Okay, let's bow our heads and let's pray.